It is Wednesday afternoon, November 10th, and we're picking up at Genesis 1-2. Sorry for those of you who sing it in the archives, but we just showed a great video. Uh, hopefully you got the link to it and you're able to see it on your own, but it's showing us the majestic power of our God. What he has created is overwhelming. When it says he created the heavens, plural, and the earth, we began to get glimpses of other galaxies and all that are out there, and it's amazing and how many light years there are away and what's beyond that and what's in the black spaces that they don't know, or the black holes, I should call them. Anyway, we have an awesome and amazing God that I bring that to you to show you. We see his majesty. We see how phenomenal he is. And then we read in our English that that the earth was without form and void. And I have to ask you, when you stop and you think of a God who is perfect, who speaks and it comes into existence, how could it be in an imperfect state? I understand our God can do anything, but it doesn't make sense. It makes far more sense to believe that our God created in a beautiful, complete, what's the word I want? It was a death. You know, he spoke and it, it happened. So the fact that we have an earth without form and void, and the fact that our Hebrew tells us that it easily could and should have been translated, the earth became without form and void, then I think we're on the right page. He didn't create chaos. He didn't create ooze and a mess. And he didn't have to hurry and try to figure out how to put it all into what we have today. But I do believe that in the restoration from what took place, we have this recording for us. So I am not for a moment disagreeing with the creation of, gen of our world according to Genesis. I'm 100% in agreement with it. What I am not in agreement with is that it was an evolutionary process, that it took time that certain things, well, let me just, if I can lay my hands on the paper, and I thought I put it where I could, let me just say, uh, yeah, I'll put it, um, this comes from a, a book by Guzik, G-U-Z-I-K, uh, he sometimes, he can just sum up things better, so I'm just going to read a paragraph to you. Some scientists now say life on Earth began when immense meteorites carrying amino acids impacted Earth at a time when the sun was cooler and the Earth was a watery ball covered with ice up to 1,000 feet thick. The idea is that a meteor hit the ice, broke through, and seeded the water underneath with the building blocks of life, which assembled into an organic soup. However, the process was triggered. The scientists said life on Earth began in a geological instant. But by an instant, they mean 10 million years or less. In the opinion of the author who wrote this book, it takes more faith to believe this than to believe in Genesis. And if you remember last week, I gave you the different things that would all have to come together at the same time. The electromagnetic field, the gravity, and all and so forth and so on for it all to just happen to come together at just the right time for life to be as we know it here on this earth, the probability is 10 to the, what was it, the 20, no, to the 42nd power, and there's only 10 to the 23rd power planets that that could happen to in our Milky Way. So what we're saying is that process that has to have time doesn't even have a chance to come together in the manner it needs to for our life to form. We know that God spoke and it came into being. And that's what I'm bringing out to you very clearly is God said, and it was so. I don't think there's any other simpler way to put it. God said, and it was so. Now, we want to look at what happened then because we don't want to build our belief on something that we can't back up to at least some degree. Something that, that we may in the end say, well, it's probable, or something in the end we may be so sure from other evidence that we can say it's definite. Where we draw our evidence is from the Word of God itself. So if the Bible is telling us that the earth became without form and void, and it's telling it to us in just the second verse, and we've got 66 books, I, won't, I don't know how many verses to look through, do we find evidence anywhere else that coincides with this? 
Or do we find anything that conflicts? Because the Word of God will not conflict. Truth will be spoken. You can't find any contradiction in Scripture. Those who say that they have, we have, and I don't want to say the explanation, but we have the answer, because the answer comes in the Word of God. Let the Word of God uh, interpret the Word of God, and you will be on the right page. So, what else do we find in the Word of God that goes along with this? We saw last week the words in Hebrew are tohu, bevohu, and that means became, or not the word became, that means without form and void. So we're looking at, uh, do we see that anywhere else in Scripture? Well, yes, we find those words in a couple other places. Let me take you to the first one. I did this last week, but we're going to go ahead and go to it again this week because we just barely started last week. And, okay. I will, my tablet changed on me, folks. Um, sorry. I will be right there with you. Isaiah 45. I say thank you, Loretta. Very thoughtful. Isaiah 45, and we're going to look at verse 18. In Isaiah 45, 18, we read, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens. Okay? We're on the same page, aren't we? Because we just read in the beginning, God created the heavens. And then it says, he is a God who formed the earth, and he made it. He established it, and he did not create it, tohu bevohu. He did not create it without form and void. In my translation here, he did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. So if Isaiah is going right out on the limb and saying it specifically, God did not create it without form and void then I've got to find out why, what to go back to Genesis 1-2. And remember, the key comes very quickly and easily in the Hebrew, which takes our word was in English and gives us the better word became. So, do we find those words somewhere else in Scripture? Yes, two more places where they're used. You're in Isaiah, so just back up to chapter 34. And in chapter uh, 34 of the book of Isaiah, Yeshia, verse 11, we read, and in the King James, it's going to call it confusion and emptiness if you have King James. But in my version here, it just uses the word emptiness. It's saying, and we're jumping into something, I'll tell you what in a moment, but it says, but pelican and hedgehog will possess it. Owl and raven will dwell in it. He will stretch over it the line of desolation and the plumb line of emptiness. Desolation and emptiness is your tohu bavohu. What we're jumping into here in Isaiah 34, if you keep it in context and you go back, you're going to see that it's talking about a, a judgment that's coming on an area. Um, long story short, we're talking Babylon, but I don't want that to throw you. The point is, there is a judgment. This judgment is going to leave this area tohu bavohu. Very interesting. It came about because of God's judging. Let's see if we're on the right track. Go with me to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 4 and verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 23. We're going to have the same words, tohu bavohu, here in Jeremiah. And this time it says, I looked on the earth, and behold, it was formless and void. To the heavens they had no light. Okay, so he saw the earth without form and void. Tohu bavohu. So, are Isaiah and Jeremiah contradicting each other? And the answer, of course, is no. Jeremiah's looking to the time when we're looking at Genesis 1-2. We're seeing the earth without form and void. Isaiah, it was referring to those words are a judgment in chapter 34, and in, in chapter 45, where we started, and he said the earth was not that way, he's looking prior. Because we have to realize time has passed. Something has happened between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. And often in Scripture, we will see time pass even in the same verse, let alone a couple of verses apart from each other. So, if we're right, and it seems that we're on the right track, then... What's our external evidence? Our external evidence is our earth itself, which shows signs of a catastrophe. It shows uh, that, that something has happened. It bears the marks of a catastrophe in its um, 
elements. What do I call it? You know, in the very earth itself, it is showing that. And I will throw out this question for you. If God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, and the heavens were orderly and beautiful and everything right, why was the earth not? Or if he created the earth in a chaotic state, why weren't the heavens created in that chaotic state? Because he's putting it in the same sentence as if he did this at the same time. Now that's an argument that someone could say, well, you don't know that he did it at the same time. And you're right, I don't know. But it certainly does seem that Genesis 1 is telling us that he's brought them into play for each other. We looked last week about the three heavens. We saw that we've got the heavens where we breathe, the air that we breathe. I'm looking for where I've got, I've got um, some references I want to give you real quick because we yeah we probably won't get here um, today it's all the way down in verse 8 that I'll pick it back up and repeat it but when we're looking at the atmospheric heavens of clouds the air that we breathe that that level Jeremiah 4 25 is speaking about that just put that down later we'll look it up when we get to verse 8 and just kind of trying to lay out an outline so that you can you can see the forest for the trees when you when you know it all this uh, Jeremiah 4:25. It is in your cross references under verse 8. Uh, then our second level is the starry heavens, the constellations, what we just saw from Giglio. Okay, and Isaiah 13:10 is speaking about that area. Then we find out that there that God is in heaven, that there's a place that's His abode where his throne is, where more than just that is. We read of that in Hebrews 9, 24, and 2 Corinthians 12, verses 2 and 4. Again, under your cross-references, and anybody in Zoom world, get a hold of me if you haven't gotten them via email. But um, there are your references. So when I'm talking about he made the heavens and the earth, and what he's referring to back here in Genesis, I believe is what is our heavens what we're needing for breathing, what we're able to go into and begin to explore now, but we know we'll never get to the ends of it, and never will man be able to get all the way into God's heaven without it being in the spirit only, you lose your body, and via the cross, the only way into heaven. Okay, so back here now, we've got an earth and a heaven, or heavens that are being made together, I think that they probably all were made with form, not without. Why else, like I say, I, I think I've made it clear. Hopefully I have. So, did something happen to the earth? Was there, if Isaiah and Jeremiah used that phrase in regard to a judgment, was there a judgment that took place on this earth that caused it to become without form and void? And I think we see that in Scripture. That's the hint that we wanted to pick up in the homework that I gave you last week. If you did your homework, you know that we're turning now to Isaiah chapter 14. Yeshia, Isaiah chapter 14. We're going to start with verse 12 in chapter 14. And we're reading. It tells you who we're to reading about very quickly. It says, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. Does anyone know who's named the star of the morning? Satan. 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 Satan Lucifer. Well, he has been given that name. So we know it's talking about his fall. 1412 of Isaiah. Thank you, Dora. This one, the star of the morning, you've been cut down to the earth. You have weakened the nations, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Ay, 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 ay. ball. We've got a problem. Nevertheless, in spite of all those eyes, verse 15, you will be thrust down to Sha'ol, to the recesses of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities, who did not allow his prisoners to go home? All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. It goes on and on. I think I can stop there. I think I've read far enough. I probably should have stopped at 17 for you. But 
don't let the word man in verse 16 throw you. We know we're talking about Satan. And you can use the word for angel and for the man sometimes interchangeably. Sometimes you have to look at the context to know which way it's being referred to. And even though we may not be able to understand every phrase and every word, we can get the gist of it. There is a point in time where Satan, pride was found in him. He decided he was going to be like equal to the Most High God. And he wanted to sit on God's throne and he wanted to receive the worship for himself. Has anything changed? No. No. <laughs> so I shouldn't put that in past tense, should I? We know that's still his goal and still what he is doing and where he is coming from. What we're talking about here, what we're reading when he's fallen from heaven, is there was a time when he presented this pride in the face of God in such a way that God said, okay, I'm going to judge you for this. And that judgment, he's cast out of heaven. It doesn't mean he's not allowed to come and, uh, what's the word he does? Um, he comes against we believers today. Um, what, oh my goodness, it's an easy word. Um, if somebody comes with an accusation, get accused, accused, accused. accused. I got no, accusation. Accused, yeah. Okay, he, I believe he is still able to accuse the saints today, the way we see he did of Job, and we see other times down through scripture. We see that. There's coming a day, I believe Revelation 12 talks about it, that tells us this fall, this pride started way back here, but now in Revelation 12, when we get to that point in the tribulation, he is cast out of heaven completely where he's not even allowed access back in. That's when he decides, because he knows his time is very short, he can read the scriptures the same as we. He's going to enter into the one called the Antichrist, and it is all hell let loose through that one for the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Mm -hmm. But that kicking out of heaven, that fall, started way back when. And we're told a third of the angels went with him that wanted him to be their God. That he he took a third of the angels. I, I believe Revelation 12, a little earlier in the chapter, gives that description there. So, what we're looking at is something happened long before, and I believe before man was created, created yes. that caused Satan to fall from the stand that God had given him. We see this falling here. Now, if that's true, he, w he was judged, not the fullness of the judgment that will put him in hellfire forever, but he was judged. God didn't let him get away with it completely, and we're going to see that in another place in Scripture, that when we put these two together, I think we get the, the picture of what we're talking about that caused this chaos to come on the face of this earth. Go with me now to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 28, and we're going to start with verse 14. Now, when we say that God created Satan, he did not create him as a man. Satan is an angel, angelic, he is a cherub, he was one of the higher cherubs, in fact, I think he probably was the highest cherub from the understanding of the wording. So, when we pick up in verse 14 of Ezekiel 28 and we read, you were the anointed cherub who covers, I believe that we're talking about Satan, right there in chapter 28 and verse 14. Now, there is a lament that, that goes out for the king of Tyre, but we see a greater description being given to us. And, and often in scripture we'll see that. There's a small fulfillment, there's a greater fulfillment. There's a, like a double, uh, it's not a double meaning, a double play that is taking on in scripture. So, I believe this is telling us about Satan's fall. You were anointed. You were the one who covers. I placed you there. This is God speaking. I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. Now, a mountain in Scripture is a kingdom. So you were in a holy kingdom of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. Stones of fire is a name given, nickname given to diamonds and to jewels. If you've ever seen them when the light hits them and they sparkle like fire, you can see why they're called that. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. Remember, Satan is a created angel. angel. Being. I can say being, just not human being. He's a created being. And he was created blameless. And everything was good until unrighteousness was found in you. What was that unrighteousness? We read it in Isaiah. 
I will be like the Most High. I will sit in the, on his throne. I will receive the worship. That's that righteousness that was found in him. He envied God's position and had the audacity to think that he should be equal to the one who created him. And even whether it be share or kick God off, he wanted that position. Going on in verse 16, by the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sin. Do we not still see that today? He is full of violence. Now remember, this is talking about one who was on earth also, but it goes to the greater. <clears throat> Therefore I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God. He got cast out of the mountain of God. I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. He looked in the mirror one day and said, Hoo, 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 look at me. I should be the one you're worshiping. <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> you corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. He, he started out well. He was beautiful. He was wise, but he corrupted it all. And because of that, he fell. And here's our similarity again. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. Um, do I want to keep going? I think... I'll read verse 18. By the multitude of your iniquities, so that one sin led to another and another and another. In the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you, has consumed you, I have turned you to ashes on the earth in all the eyes, in the eyes of all who see you. To me, that's looking all the way down to where he will be in hellfire, all the way down through the quarter of time. But we see it talking now about a judgment that cast him out of the holy mountain of God. And this mountain of God was beautiful. He walked up and down among the stones of fire, the jewels. Okay? Hold on just a second, Loretta, and I'll get your question. Now, we know from the restoration that we read about in the rest of Genesis, we know that there was water that was covering the face of the earth. Okay? It's not that that we that scientists say, you know, the what did the what did they say? A thousand feet? Yeah, a thousand feet thick in ice. No, but the, there is water. We're going to see that the Holy Spirit's going to brood over those waters, and we'll talk about what that means very shortly. But what I believe is that God brought a judgment on the earth. Now, we have an example of that. Run ahead to Genesis chapter 9. Not that far, but it is a little bit of time. And you come to Noah. You come to the time when man's yes. thoughts were only evil continually. And God says, I've got to judge it. And when he judged it, how did he judge it? Waters Water. covered the face of the earth. Then at the end of that, when he brings Noah safely through, he comes out of the ark and he's on dry ground for the first time. God puts a rainbow in the sky. We've talked about that being his signature and part of God himself. And he said, I will never destroy the earth again in this manner. Now, he can say that just because he did it once. You only need to do it once to say that. But if he did it here with Satan and he did it here again with Noah, I think he's saying, I'm not going there a third time. And we know that the earth, when it is finally destroyed, all the way over in Revelation, um, well, we talk about the new heavens and the new earth in chapter 21 and 22. We know, well, it's 2 Peter 3 that talks about the elements being dissolved. We know that's at the end of time as we know it laid out in Scripture when we're moving off into eternity future. And you ask me what's going to happen in eternity future? I don't know, but I can't wait. <laughs> All I know is when I see what we were just shown, I'm going to fly through those heavens and see the glories up front and personal. I want to see what my God has created. And I think I'm going to stand there in space, you know, just hanging out saying, Wow, God, you are awesome. You are amazing. How can you think up the colors, the designs, the creativity? And what else does he have out there? We've learned about stars and planets, and that's about it. What else is out there? Well, we're going to have an eternity to find out and to serve our God during that time. But anyone who thinks you're going to be sitting on a cloud, strumming a harp and bored, <laughs> I have news for you. You don't know, my God. <laughs> if you think that you can be more creative than he, oh, hello, 
Don't be like Satan. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> Get her in the eyes and realize. So what I think we have is that Satan's kingdom was earth. He walked among the, uh, the earth. He walked up and down in the earth. He enjoyed the splendors of the earth. Where do we find those jewels today? On the ground, all over the earth. Underneath. Underneath. Yes. In. We mine them, don't we? Yes. We dig them out. They're no longer on the surface. Right. Well, if the surface broke up, if waters covered it to destroy the kingdom that Satan had, in essence, and I like the way he said it, Pastor Frederick, beloved memory, in heaven with the Lord, has all the answers now. Mm -hmm. Not fair. He took cuts. <laughs> But he said to me, are you telling me, he had quite the scientific mind, but he says, are you telling me that God turned earth inside out? And, you know, you might be on to something. <laughs> I don't know exactly how it was, but God judged this earth, brought this water over the face of the earth. When the recreation, the restoration is given, we do have the jewels on the inside now. We have them inner instead of outer. Remember, all of the earth is separate the consequences of sin from Adam. What about the consequences of sin from Satan? I think that it changed it. God still made this world beautiful, made it inhabitable for beauty forever until sin again corrupted it. Okay, but I think that's what we're looking at in this chapter. I think that it's showing us definitely Satan's fall, where he came from, why he so badly wants back in, why he slithered, and I'll use that word, into the Garden of Eden to corrupt God's man that God put in, as Satan put it, my kingdom. But remember, he's lost it. God brought another. And we'll talk about that more as we come to it. i got to do Loretta first, and then I'm back to you. Yes? I don't understand the part. You know, God created, you know, um, the devil, right? Mm -hmm. He created everything. Well, Nothing was created. He, did. he created. He knew God. He knew his heart. Like all the angels. Mm -hmm. How did he turn so, you know, with pride if God created? Because God's perfect. How did he create an angel that could turn on him? The same way God created humanity. Humanity has done the same thing. Yes. They've turned their heart against God. They even declare, I wasn't created by God. I evolved. God always has a plan. <laughs> Excuse me. God always what? I'm sorry. Has a plan. Yes. I believe that even in the angelic form, because a third went with Satan, I believe that they had a form of choice also. That God didn't just create something that he's pulling the strings and he's making them. He gave them a freedom in there to worship him, to honor him. He gave them a perfect environment. He was in their very presence. Because the next question someone might think to ask, and I will get to you, is, okay, well, if Adam did the same thing as Satan, why did God go to all the trouble of coming down to earth in the form of a human being, his name Yeshua Jesus, to die for Adam, but he didn't do that for Satan. Why favor one over the other? And I think the answer is very easy. Because Satan was not human. Okay, and that would be why he didn't come in human form, but why didn't he come in angelic form and rescue the angels, Satan and the others? Yeah. See, that that would be, that's their line of logic. Well, if he, if he gave in essence, if he gave Adam a second chance, why didn't he give Satan a second chance? And I think the answer to it is, Satan was right in the very presence of God, in a perfect atmosphere, where there was no deception. We know Eve was deceived. There was none of what our human beings had, had happened to them on earth. When Satan got to Eve and to Adam both, God wasn't with them at that moment. Remember, he would come walk with them in the cool of the day. So it's a whole different setting. I don't think Satan was ever out of the presence of God. So he willfully 
sin, there's no other way to put it, willfully turned his heart against his very creator in his presence, in a perfect environment with everything for him. God had even given him a whole planet. And enjoy it. You know, and he probably had others that, that were under him because you've got a kingdom, you've got a king, and you've got, you know, people under you, your princess, and you finally come down to, to the peons. You know, there's another word, but I'm finding words today. So I think that it's the idea of the audacity in the very presence of God. And this is what was inexcusable. Now, did God know that was going to happen when he created Satan? Absolutely, because he knows everything. But he also knew that about man. And yet he knew he would make a, a way of redemption for man. And the question that would be asked then, well, why did he give free choice? Why did he give the ability for this sin to come in? Why didn't he just shut it off? And again, it's because God is a God of love. And he didn't want something that he, no other way to do it, but like a puppet. Pull Rochelle's string, say, I love you. And anybody, when they were little, have a, a little dolly that they pulled a string and That's it would Jack say, Kathy. Okay, <laughs> Chad Kathy. I didn't have one, but there you go. Sorry, men, <laughs> you may not be able to relate. But the idea is that doll didn't really love its owner. And if it's, you pull a string and it says, I love you, well, somebody else is pulling the string and it's saying, I love you, you know, that's not real. That's not genuine. And our God, who was a God of love, wanted what he was creating to love him and to want that relationship with him. And so he gave the capacity for us to know love. But in the capacity of knowing love, we also know how to turn from that love and how to, Satan took it and warped it and wanted it for himself. So therein is why I think that God did not rescue him and those who followed him, but did take the steps to rescue mankind because it wasn't the same atmosphere, the same setting. Now, he could have kept Adam from ever sinning by giving him no free will and he just had to do. But then how could God show his love? How could he show who he is? How could he have a real relationship? You don't have a relationship with someone who doesn't have a choice. Is, it's real when there's a choice there. So God had to allow choice. And in his magnanimous mind, he came up with a plan. But he to give us choice, but he don't have to give the enemy a choice. He could have kicked him in the butt and said, no, nope, you ain't going to touch me. But I think he attacked Adam and Eve because of God. But oh, yeah. And I think he did. And, and I'm using her vernacular not mine, but he did kick Satan in the back. <laughs> he kicked him out of heaven and we'll kick him into the hellfires well, in his perfect time. All these angels with him. Yes, yes. So there had to have been, and he created hell for them because Matthew 25, 40 or 41, whichever it is, tells us that very clearly, that, that hell was created for the devil and his angels. It was not created for man, and it's not his will that any man end up there. That's why he died for whosoever. He died for anyone and everyone who will receive him. Do you still remember your question? Yes. Well, okay. So did this happen before he created night and day? Yes. yes. The night and day that we have in Genesis? Yes. This would be before that. Now what it was like then, I can't tell you. I can only tell you what it's like for us, what we have recorded for us. But yes, this was before day one, okay, which is a perfect lead-in. And I think we might even be ready for it. Oh, 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 let me bring out one more point also. Um, and I heard it in the video. God is light. We know in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. We know it was by God speaking that it came into existence. We know from John 1, 4, in Him was the light and the life. I think it says of man. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm questioning my own, uh, let me get it there. Um, I love this chapter. I love it in the, the Greek and I love it in the English. Um, there's so much there, too. We could go on it for a whole couple classes. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness couldn't swallow up the light. The light swallows up the darkness. There's a messianic song, and I love it. It says, when the light comes, the darkness must flee. 
You've got a room that's dark, and when you flip on that light, the darkness is gone. It has to flee. It's not that the darkness takes over the light, and then it's dark. It's the other way. So, yes, before we even had the light and the darkness that we're going to talk about in day one, which we're coming right up to, we're right on the heels of right now, um, this that happened, Satan, on this earth as his kingdom was prior to that. It was between the time God created it and the time of verse 2, where we find it without form, we find it in void, we find it needing to be <coughs> to, to be worked on. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's look at... Okay. Yeah, I think we're ready. Let's go ahead and let's look at uh, Genesis 1 and verse 2. Okay. The earth... Well, we started it. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Okay. The darkness is what we need to talk about right now. With the waters over the earth... It's waters when you have waters with any kind of depth you it's you cannot see the further you go down you know it gets darker and darker and darker and darker so the waters covering are showing that there is a darkness on the face of the earth now again I will tell you a God of light who is creating isn't going to create darkness he isn't going to create chaos or void he's going to create beautiful so this darkness to me fits again with judgment and we know that even in hell, there is a darkness to hell, that it's not bright and sunshiny because it's void of the light of the world. That's the light that we're going to be bathed in forever. The Revelation 21 and 22 make that very clear. There's no sun and moon and stars in heaven for us. There's none in the New Jerusalem. It, the light of it is the Lord. He is the lamp. He is the light. And so hell... The absence of everything that is God is dark. And if anyone has ever been, and I hope you have not, I have, I hope never to repeat it, but if you've been in the midst of fire, it is amazing how fire at once is bright in its burning, but is dark in its surroundings. I don't know how to explain it. Gives me chills to this day. Takes me back to a very dark place that I don't want to go. So, darkness then to me, is an emblem of Satan. This is fitting of him. This darkness that was on this earth was the judgment on him. But why do I say it fits him? Look with me about him, because he's something we have to contend with while we're on this earth. Yes. Ephesians 6. And y'all are saying, oh, I know this verse. <laughs> but think of it in this new light. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's really not against other people. And I lost my place, sorry. But against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness, okay? Darkness and wickedness, that's what we're really fighting. These powers, these rulers, you'll say, well, where are they? And it tells us in the heavenly places. The prince of the power of the air today, and we breathe that air, is Satan. He is still at work. We see it in what man does to man. That is not anything that resembles God, their creator. That resembles Satan, the enemy of our God. There is a real battle going on. Without going into detail, look up, and I didn't think to get the chapter, but it'll be probably in 1 Kings, um, Elisha, Elisha, Elisha um, can, yeah, I think 1 Kings. I know Elijah's in 1 Kings. Anyway, Elisha follows him. There's the time when he and his servant Gehazi are in a battle. Gehazi's in a panic. They're surrounded. They're outnumbered. He thinks it's all over. And Elisha, Elisha in, your, in your English, he is at Shalom. He's not panicky. And he prays for his servant. He says, God, open his eyes that he would see. And when this happens, what does he see in the heavens? He didn't see it on the earth, but in the heavens. He saw there were more than angelic warriors for them than there were against them. And that's where the real battle is won. Where do you win your spiritual battles? You win them in prayer. You win them in heaven with the Lord. You don't win them by putting on your gloves and boxing, believe me, you'll lose every time. 
but you put on the spiritual powers and you win that battle. So this darkness, I think, very easily is a picture of what Satan brought the, to, to this world or caused to happen to this world. Look at Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 2. Keep up. Second Peter chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 4. What chapter? Two. And it's in your cross references. We're on track with these verses. Yes, ma'am. I only have the page four at the cross reference. And are we on page five now? That's that's what's really confusing. Right. You just tell what page? Because I don't know. No, don't know nothing about. Okay, it should say Genesis one two on the cross references. And look for the verses under there. Okay, we are on, and I'll give you, I'm just going to give you a whole set right now, Dora. You can give me back what you want later. But if you're looking on the cross-references, we're passing an action. Okay, we are, yes, we are on page five. I don't have those, I think. Okay. Um, the cross-references. Okay, let me give this, you said you've got one through four. Here's five on. Uh, and I know if I do leave them behind, okay, here we go. Rosa, I'll give you this set. So if he's offering you to punch holes and to staple, but let me tell you, we're on page five right now. I'm giving you up through page eight, which finishes Genesis one. Okay. You're going to get cross-references for chapter two, three, four. I have no idea. This may be a hundred pages by the time we get done. Okay. There you go, it's on page 5 that we're at. Halfway down through Genesis 1-2. Does everybody see on page 5? It'll say Genesis 1-2, it'll be underlined, and then it'll have a lot of different references. That's where we're at. Now, I don't promise you that I 100% of the time I stick with it, and that's why I try to tell you if I'm adding in, because as the Holy Spirit brings something in my mind, I'm going to bring it out. Um, and I may skip something too, but they're still good verses. You know, they're still fitting. So in this case, now we're looking at Second Peter, chapter. Yes. This is Rhonda. Did you email that? Because I didn't get it. Okay. I may have pulled the same stuff I did this morning, and not that a long time ago. It should have been emailed to you. Um, oh, okay, that. Okay, I'll go to my own notes. Okay. okay, I'll go to my own notes. And I will check out my email tonight also to see if it's there. Uh, Ruth needs it. Anyone else in Zoom room need it? Okay, Rhonda, don't go looking. i got too many hands raising. All of you who get emails from me, I will either resend or send, whichever the case may be. I'll put you all together, and I'll do it. Lord willing, I'll even do it this evening. Thank you for bringing it to my attention, because I thought you all had that... Oh, mine just says uh, B, C, and D. Okay, and then I changed that. You got the old ones. Oh, we see. Because I changed out. It's the same thing. Um, okay, you need the next page. You need E. Do you have E? Oh, no. Thank you. I need that. <laughs> no, I stopped at D. Very much. I'm going there after class. Okay, you need, and I'm out of them here. Share with Dora, and I'll get your she copy. She needs after page A. Right. Right, but if you can look yeah, on she her... Needs, she has five. Oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, she... Yeah, I, she didn't have five, but I... Okay. But I have five. Okay. She put five on there for me. Well, I'm losing too much note. time. Second Peter 2, 4. I'll try to do this, but I'll probably forget. Okay? And again, I'm sorry. I, I feel like I should have been better prepared. Okay, Second Peter, Second Keep it 2, 4 says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, that's what we've just been talking about. When Satan was kicked out of heaven, uh, or kicked down, lost his kingdom here on earth because of that pride, and the third of the angels went with him. Revelation 12 refers to this also. Um, you can read that probably starting with verse 9, I think, for that part. Um, but read it somewhere in there, you'll find it but cast them into hell. Now, we know that's the future, okay, when all will be cast into hell. But he committed them to pits of darkness, okay? We're going to find out that there are some that are in pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Apparently, some, it's so bad, Satan himself is so bad, he's never going to come up for a judgment in the same way as the others. When God puts a final end to him, he is just cast into the lake of fire. And apparently there are some of his followers 
that are so bad, God isn't allowing them this time in between. They're being held in pits of darkness. Let me show you that also in the book called Jude. Jude in my uh, Hebrew. But Jude is only one chapter long. If you have a tablet, still put in Jude chapter 1 because you won't get it otherwise. But all I need to say is Jude verse 6. Verse 6 is talking about the same thing, saying, And angels who did not keep their own domain. Okay, their own, they didn't keep to their heavenly home. Okay, something happened. They abandoned their proper abode. He's kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of that great day. So there are some that are being bound. They're chained. They're in darkness. They are waiting a day of judgment. That will come way down the line. We're going to see it after Revelation 20 or, or about in there, toward the end of 20. When I say that, I hope you realize the tribulation has happened, the coming, the second coming of the Lord has happened, the millennial kingdom has happened, then you have the great white throne judgment. I believe it's also at that time that these, that he's holding, will go into their judgment at the same time, because we move from there into the new heavens and the new earth, okay? So, what we are seeing is that darkness is speaking of, um, an evilness, an emblem of Satan. There's something, you know, the darkness is not, it's not good. And in this case, even on the face of the earth, the darkness is going to be removed. It's not the darkness that we're calling night, okay? This is a darkness from the waters. And in fact, back in Genesis, it says something about that. So let's go back there and read it. Um, the darkness was over the surface of the deep. You may have over the face of the deep, but really face isn't a good, because when you talk about the face of something, you're talking about surface, and this word surface really, the idea is, uh, is it involves the whole depth. Um, another word for it is the presence. There was, there was a presence of darkness that was here, that God's going to intervene in. And remember again, a God who is light, how could he have created that, you know, by his spoken word? I just don't believe it comes that way. But by his judgment, yes, it would come. So, wherever the deep was, and the deep we know refers to waters in scripture later. Look real quick, just to prove my point, look at Genesis um, chapter 7 and verse 11. Okay, because that's not far for you to go to find it. So, Genesis 7... And verse 11, and we read there, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the, seventh, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were open. We know that, that earth bellowed up and water came forth, and we know water came from the heavens. This is the time of Noah's flood. So it was water from underneath and it was water from above. But notice that water is referred to as the deep. Chapter 8 and verse 2. Just go over one more chapter. Chapter 8 and verse 2. And we have also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed and the rain from the sky was restrained. Okay, this is when God's causing the waters to subside. Verse 1 tells us that. So when we see, in Genesis especially, when we see the deep referred to, it's referring to waters. So we have deep waters because we have deep waters. We've got a darkness that's here. That leads us to believe, again, judgment on Satan. What happened now in the midst of those waters? Because we know that the earth wasn't left in that state. It didn't start in it, and it's not left in it. We've got a restoration that takes place. And that's what we continue to read. So in that darkness, on the surface of the deep, and more than just the surface, but in the presence of that deep, something spectacular happens. It says, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now, this is, introduces us to the third person of the Godhead. We've seen in the beginning, Bereshit, Bar Bara, Son created, Elohim, God created. So in our first three words, we had God and the Son. Now we've got the Spirit of God. We've got our third person of the Godhead revealed. Now, the same word to give us spirit, at other times we get the word wind or we get the word breath. That's ruach in the Hebrew. R-U-A-C-H if you want to see it in uh, 
in our English, okay? So when we say Ruach HaKodesh, which I'll put the whole thing out for you, Ha and then Kodesh, we know that we're referring to spirit. Which spirit? Ha tells us the spirit. <coughs> Kodesh tells us, the key word for us, the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, in our Hebrew here, in Genesis 1-2, we don't have HaKodesh. We just have the Spirit of Elohim. The Spirit of God moved. Okay? I'm just telling you because a lot of you are with me and you hear our songs and you hear our themes and our uh, Messianic teachings. I want you to be able to connect it, put it together, and it makes sense for you. So, um, it's indicating by the fact that it can be spoken of as wind or as breath, and we're going to see its movement here. What we're seeing indicated is, and I don't like, but I don't know a better way to put it, it's like an energizing force. Um, what we're seeing is the omnipresence of God moving out and is at work. God is everywhere. He's not just confined to the throne he sits on. His presence is everywhere. Um, I want to give to you, if I brought it, um, this is, honestly, when I read these men, they are um, Hebrew Christians from long ago. They are very scholarly. I have to hold on for all it's worth and read it over and over and over, and, and still I don't fully grasp it. But this is the way they put it for this section we're talking about, darkness upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moving. They said that darkness, the Hebrew, and they go into the Hebrew roots and the depth of the meaning that I is beyond my level, because I've told you, you hear me use some Hebrew, but believe me, I'm a baby in, in Hebrew. Okay, it's time out to roar or to rage is denoting raging waters. So there were roaring waters. We read this also in Psalm 42, 7. It talks about the waters raging. Okay, or you would think like the flood. And that also gives us the depths of the seas. It gives us also, and it referred to it, the abyss of the earth. The abyss is the pit. And we know that there is a pit that Satan is confined in during the Millennial Kingdom that he can't get out of. So it all fits in that Hebrew that, that we're seeing it. The deeper you go, you can even go into the depths of the abyss. Okay? The earth and the firmament are still undistinguished. We don't have the next verses yet. We're coming into them rapidly, but they're not there yet. So everything at this stage is, and it's like our Hebrew said, unformed, and it's darkness. Enter into that the breath, the wind, the ruach, the spirit of God. And it's not a breath of wind caused by God, but it's, it is God. How do I get this? How do we understand with finite minds? Okay? But it's not just like I take in a breath and I breathe it out. It's more than that. It's like the, the creative force of God going out and moving is seen in the spirit. Okay, so the Spirit is almost carrying it out. But you can't see the Spirit as any less than God himself. That's why this is really a hard concept to wrap our minds around. But it's the principle of all life, because we're going to know in time God breathed in the man and became a living soul. Now, God didn't stay there and give him CPR for the rest of his living days. And he doesn't give us CPR for us, but we continue to breathe. That spirit is continuing, the, the force that's from God. And it worked on the formless matter that we are seeing described. And as they put it, it's going to be separating, quickening. It's going to prepare for living forms. It's going to call into being by God's creative word. So God spoke, the spirit did. But at the same time, I don't want you to see it in two separate entities. You've got to see it as one. So, if you can grasp that, wrap your head around it, great. If you can't, take it by faith. Because, again, how do you take an infinite God and bring him down to a finite mind that he created? We can't get there. But we see that this spirit of God, this very breath, this creative force, this energy, and, and I don't like those words because you have made the force be with you and the energies and all of that. And that's 
that's the talent's counterfeit. But in God, in his perfection, then you have, uh, and it says that the spirit of God was moving over the face of the deep. Okay? It moved. Now, the Hebrew, I love the Hebrew. Because the Hebrew gives you the idea, not just hovered over, but brooded. Do you know what the word brood means? Something's brewing. <laughs> it, it's not brewing, it's brooded. <laughs> okay? And it's, again, sometimes an object, a picture is better than words, but we're talking about the word brooded. 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 Covering. Not brood as in a drink. <laughs> no, we're not saying brood. We're saying brooded. Okay? The only way I know is to describe it to you. You ever seen a mama hen? Yes. Do you see her with her little chicks? <clears throat> And they, they've just, they've gotten the ability to kind of get out there now, and they get, exactly, she's, and she's getting them, and she's bringing them under her wing, and she's telling them to follow. Have you ever watched how they follow Mama? They'll go right across the road following her, they'll go into the water following her. She is God to them, okay? And she's brooding over her little chicks, and God help the one who gets between Mama Hen and her babies, okay? <laughs> I won't go into it, but when I taught school, I had third grade, I, uh, someone once said, <laughs> that's Mama Hen and her babies. And I thought, good, good, because I want them to know, you know. That's the idea. God was, was over his, this creation that he's bringing into a form for us. He knows what he's doing. He's not, hmm, what shall I do? He's carrying out his plan. And he brooded over it. He hovered over it. You can even get the idea that in his moving <coughs> over it, it starts to vibrate. It starts to breathe life. The same way when God breathed into a dome, he became a living soul. Now, here's an idea. I think it's a good idea. <coughs> Not mine, but I, I think it makes sense. They take this and they say the vibration could easily have been waves. We talk today in science of light waves. We talk about all kinds of different waves that move, that have energy, that cause things to happen. Okay? We even hear through waves that are they're coming and hitting our eardrums. So the idea that they get is that this was the forming of light waves and sound waves and heat waves. And waves typically move back and forth. So in essence, if we could see it, and I hope we get to see a replay one day, I would love to see how God did it. We see the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters, and we see the waters starting to move, and they're starting to stir, and they're starting to be brought into a shape, and they're starting to um, vibrate with life. Okay, God's at work. Um, by the way, just in case if you do wonder, it is the same word when it talks about holy men wrote as they were um, moved by the Holy Spirit. This is Second Peter 1.21. It is the same word, and it's the same idea. Now, I can tell you from my teaching, I get this privilege. Thank you one and all, because if you weren't there, I wouldn't get to do what gives me the most joy in this life. The only thing that, that equates it is leading someone to the Lord. There's just as much joy in that. But when I'm teaching, I feel this bubbling up. I feel something start. And it's, it gets more and more, and I just can't hardly contain it sometimes. And you've seen that. And I see that as what happened to the men as they wrote, that God was stirring inside of them. And I think they were getting so excited. They're writing as fast as their hand can go because they're not writing their words. They're writing God's words. And I pray I'm speaking his words. When I'm trying to convey these thoughts, I'm saying, Holy Spirit, please take over. Take my tongue. Bring out the words and let them hear with their spiritual ears. Because this is beyond me. I'm just as human as all the rest of us. Believe me. Maybe a little more so. But this is God at work. And I see God at work now. Moving. And that's what we read here. And what happened when God started moving over the surface? Now he says, and this is the first time we get the spoken, God said. Okay? And boom, it happens. God said, let there be light. And there was light. That's the power of the spoken word. 
God speaks, that's it. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, and then the Word we know is the Lord. It is He Himself. It's our second person of that triunity that we see Him, the speaker for God. Because the voice we hear in, in our scriptures are His words that He says, I'm only speaking the words that the Father gives me to speak. I'm only doing the works that the Father sent me to do. And He sends it right back to the Godhead that we know He is the same part of. So, someone broke it down. If you like it, take it. If you don't, that's okay, because everything falls short. Just like my egg isn't three equal parts, so even though it shows you the Trinity, it's not perfect. This said, the Father, God the Father, is the source of all things. The Spirit is the energizer of all things. And the Son, the Word, is the revealer of all things. I like it. I like it. Father's the source, spirit, the energizer, the son, the revealer. The way it falls down is the father's also the energizer and the revealer, and the son also is. You know, you can enter, and often, especially with God the Father and God the Son, you look in Scripture and you'll see the same attributes given to both. You'll see the description where it's hard to tell sometimes, are we describing Jehovah or are we describing Yeshua? It's amazing. But to finish our thought for today, and then we can open it to the questions and discussions also, what did God do initially here? It said, let there be light. Now, notice the difference. It doesn't say, and God created the light. It said, he said, let there be light. Okay, the original, the creative act is not being implied here. The idea from the Hebrew is he made the light to appear. He made it visible. God speaking would create that energy. We've talked about that. And since God is light, the energy from him would be light. We have light coming by his speaking. So we have the beginning of what we're going to see is light. And we're going to see, because we're talking about moving in waves, that as those waves are coming to earth, we have light. Earth is turning as it turns from the light. We're going to have the darkness. We're not creating the sun, the moon, and the stars here, folks. This is just simply light and darkness. Light that God brought in to make it appear and make it visible. And obviously with light, then you have the opposite. You have that darkness when there's the absence of that light. So we're not to day four. You've got to wait all the way to day four to get your sun, <laughs> to get your moon, to get your stars. And it's going to be important to remember we have light before that we have those there because that's also going to disqualify another theory out there of the evolutionary process of time because some want to say God put time into it and let it fall into line. But we're going to see an imbalance that would come long before thousands of years between all of this. So, Is this if, kind of a, a permission type of Yes. Light? Kind of like a permission. Yes. Let there be light. There already was. He is light. Right. So then he's giving permission for, for it light to come on to, to, to come into play in, in what he is in the midst of restoring, creating at times, because we're going to see there are times when he does use the word created. We'll see the difference between creating out of nothing, creating out of something, and now we have what isn't talking about creation at all, just made to appear. All three are different words with our Hebrew, and this is the made to appear. In the beginning here, he's light, and in Revelation, he's light. There is, you know, it's always Adam and Jesus. You know what I'm sharing? So he's light, and then it will be light. And, and, and I'm laughing because she's way ahead, but she's so right on target. Well, because they because, coincide, yeah. you know, Jesus and Adam, you know. How and it's is. very, yeah. very good to see that it didn't start with here, and it doesn't end with this. Right. It started with light, and it does end so with light in also. Hebrew, in your Hebrew Bible, does it say, we say in Spanish, sea la luz, which was already, the light was already Oh, okay, good. Yeah, the light was yeah. already there. That's yeah, a good way to put it. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Say it, Rosa. Sea la luz. 
sea la luz, it was already there. Y dijo, Dios sea la luz, y hubo luz. Sea la luz? Sea la luz. Sea. Okay. I love it. I love it. Because that's great. The more that we can get into those languages that we understand better, our heart language is less great. Yes. And one thing, too, is that if he created this world for Satan and his mm -hmm. followers, there would need to be light, anyways. He'd have it basically turned off. Well, and the light is from God. Mm -hmm. God was there before Satan, before he created the earth as Satan's kingdom. Yeah, and I'm sure, yes. Well, we saw the stones of fire on the surface. Yeah, okay. Even that tells you there's light, you know, so yes. But now the light that he's bringing in, making to appear, is his interacting with his recreation. I'll put it that way. Okay, recreation or restoration. Because yeah. sometimes he's just restoring and sometimes he is recreating. But we'll see the differences. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, This is the message we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Remember, when the light comes on, the darkness has to flee. And we'll see how, if it's waves that are coming of light to the earth as the earth turns, it doesn't see that light. That's how we get the darkness, because God's presence is everywhere. And here it's in uh, um, Karen brought it out. Revelation 21. And I think I want verse 23. Revelation 21, 23. Ladies, I think you got your whole thought. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Good to have you. Lord bless you. Um, and we will tie it up real close here. Revelation 21, 23. Talking about the new Jerusalem. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp is the Lamb. What's the lamp of the New Jerusalem? Yeshua. Jesus. The lamp has a name. And chapter 22 and verse 5, the very last chapter of our scriptures. Come on. Come on, tablet. Okay, here's one of my first. No, I thought I had a glitch. 22, 5. And there will no longer be any night. They will not need it. They will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Let me back that up. Is it here? Well, okay. We're trying to make it short, just back up to verse 3 to see who he's talking about. There's no longer any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. He's, he's giving the description of heaven. But it's where there's no longer any curse. That means no sin. The throne of God and the Lamb's in it. His bond servants will serve him. Who's his bond servants? We are. We are. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> very good. Very good. Read many of Paul's um, starts to his letters to us, and he'll call himself the bond servant of Yeshua HaMashiach, of Jesus the Christ. We are who he's talking about there, that we are going to be in his presence, in his throne room. We're going to be with him. We are going to be where there is no curse, no sin. And it tells us never a lie enters in. I think he says that because a lie started it all, and that will never enter in. They'll see his face, his name will be on their foreheads, and they will. there will no longer now be any night the need, and it goes on with what I read, because the Lord God is illuminating. Is that not awesome and amazing? That's our future and what we have to look forward to. That is the, the creation of God that is never tainted by sin. That is His very presence. We're talking His heaven. That is our home. Hallelujah. As much as I think what we saw is glorious, and I can't wait to fly past that cross that's, what, 31 million light years out there, and look at it and just, wow, God, because there's no other words, yet yeah, I'm going to go far beyond that and into his very presence, into his light, his love, his glory forever. Have you ever basked in the sunshine? <laughs> We'll try basking in the S-O-N shine. Do okay, it. is this going to be um, when we go to heaven, or is this going to be the millennium, or is it going to be after the thousand years? Because, right? Because, go ahead. Oh, well, because there's, I mean, 
after after the tribulation, there's going to be people here on earth. Yes. It's still going to be day and night. Yes. Down here is different than in God's heaven. Okay, so it's going to be when we go to heaven. Yes. When when we go to heaven, we'll start experiencing it. <clears throat> The description being given is telling us about the eternal heaven, the heaven that goes out after everything, after the millennial reign, after the judgments, all of that, when God makes new heavens and a new earth, and we don't know what those look like, but that will be amazing, and is entertaining the wrong word, but it'll be entertaining. <laughs> but then it's telling us that our eternal heaven with the Lord, where we are forever. I mean, he can send us out on assignment, but that's our, it's our home. Yes. There's another way to put it. It's our home. That's what he's describing. Yes. The one that, that will go on forever. But when I mentioned earlier that my dad went home to be with the Lord 17 years ago today, he went into God's heaven. He's in that glory. He's in that, you know, th there's no night for him. And there's no lack of light and no lack of all the all that goes with God, grace and love and, and all of that. And there's there is not the troubles and the trials and, and the sin and, and all of that. So I don't want you to think it waits for there. But God's telling us in his eternal, this is where it goes. And he may not use the sun, moon, and stars in the new heavens and the new earth that we don't really know much about. He may have something else because he's a God who creates, mm -hmm. you know, and you'd think, well, what can he do? Well, could you have thunk up this? <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> Try to be creative sometime. Try to create out of nothing, <laughs> and I guarantee you, you'll get nothing. <laughs> and you may be able to take something, and if you're a great science-minded, you may be able to create something out of something, but it's nothing like what our God can and will do. And it's nothing that's been created perfectly that will be. So, amazing and awesome, is it not? Does it make you excited? Does it make you feel like you can hardly wait? Yes, Anne. And I mean Anne in Zoom room. <laughs> um, what was the name of Mr. Guzik's book? I brought it. I didn't get to the quote I'm going to read. That's what I thought. Genesis. <laughs> it's just Genesis. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. He has written many books on Bible books, and I think he just always calls them by their name. It's like commentary on it, um, but I, I love his scientific mind. Uh, okay. But, uh, yeah. And, and this book, and then I remember you mentioning one other book that you found particularly resourceful in your studies. Well, it probably was when I was reading right then, because <laughs> um, I, I've used a number of sources. I don't know which other one would be standing out in your mind. Uh, let me you go. said a favorite so far. I know it's hard to remember. Might be Gleanings in Genesis by Pink, P-I-N-K, just like the color. It might have been that, but there are so many that are good out there. Um, and I use many sources, and every time I go through, like we started Genesis before, but I've come back to it. I've added in Gusick's another one of the new ones. Um, he's online by the Enduring Word. If you want online and don't want to purchase, you can go look at that, you know, Enduring Word, all one word, dot, either com or org, I think just, just dot com. Uh, many good sources out there, though. I'm not sure. I'm trying to think, Anne. If I come back up with it, I'll let you know. Rowena? You can oh. pull up Enduring Word and read this book. Yes. Yes, so you don't have to hard copy purchase it. There are those, like me, who will never give up a hard copy book, too, especially because this can fail, folks. This, yeah, I have a love-hate relationship with it. <laughs> I love it when it works. But um, it can be blocked, too. Wait. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Pink's book was Gleanings and... Gleanings and Genesis, I think. Oh. I think if you don't find it quite by that, let me know and I'll look at home. Okay. Okay, Rowena? Yeah, I, mean, I just like to share something. There's this um, evolutionist, um, agnostic, his name is Spencer, and he said something like, um, all natural phenomena in the universe 
can ultimately be divided into an interaction of five basic manifestations. And he said it was time, force, action, space, and matter. So he did not realize he was declaring Genesis 1-1. And please spell it out. I've been praying for this to come back to me because I could not remember who introduced me to it. Obviously, it was you, Rowena, and I wanted it in my notes, and I said, Lord, please bring it back to me. So you're an answer to prayer, and please explain it because this is ideal. I love it. Remember, this okay. is an evolutionist that, that gave that. So if an evolutionist says you need these five factors so that things are, are, are moving or evolving, he actually is like uh, testifying that truly there is no evolution because God started it all. Because in the beginning, that is time. God, He is the force. Created, He is the action. The heavens, that space. And the earth, that's matter. And He said all these five things should come together in a combination to produce things to move. Oh, that's awesome. Amen. Isn't that awesome? I love it. Thank you, Rowena. I so appreciate it. And yes, and I'll be bringing out to you more of the evolutionists and what they say and the fallacies according to, to science's own laws. God's put laws into motion. And, you know, the, I mean, really, honestly, it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in a master designer who we know is God. Um, can you tell us what you said? Oh, you could not hear. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, this is an evolutionist by the name of Spencer who said that um, he sees the evolutionary process for creation. But what he was really attesting to is Genesis 1-1 because he said to have, to, have, to have creation, you have to have time, force, action, space, and matter. If you lack any one of those, you don't have a creation. But what he attested to was Genesis 1 went in the beginning, time. God, that's the force. Created, there's your action. The heavens, there's your space. Earth, there's your matter. So everything that he, from a scientific viewpoint, sees that's needed to make a creation, Genesis 1 went, summed it all up. What was the name of Guzik's book? I missed it. Genesis. Okay. And it's a commentary that Genesis. And it's G U Z I K. Okay. I have another. David Guzik. Okay. Good name. I'm looking at one David and I got a brother uh, David. <laughs> Love the name. Uh, Love the men. <laughs> something kind of clicked, I guess. Maybe I you were saying that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters, and that part of his name is wind, and um, when God cleared the path for Noah and the Israelites to go across the sea. For Moses? And he, yeah, for Moses. What did I say, Noah? Sorry. That's okay. For Moses, would that not have been the Holy Spirit? Moving the waters. I can the I can look and see what it says in the scripture. We know it was an act of God, so I have no argument with what you're saying. They're one in the same. <laughs> right, right. So, but I can look and see how specific it gets there. But yeah, it, it, it would make sense. And I love that in the Hebrew it gives the idea that the waters gelled. Yeah. It's, it's, they were you know flimsy. They they gelled. They had sides <clears throat> to them. Ruth, you've been very, very patient, and welcome back to class. Unmute yourself, because I see you're muted before you try to talk. Before you talk, Ruth. Unmute yourself, Ruth. <laughs> Are you hearing me, Ruth? She's going 90 miles an hour. <laughs> okay, Ruth, start all over. We can hear you now. Can you hear me? Now we can. I'm so happy to be back. I have so many people look at my phone. And I spent late, I finally went to Apple and spent three hours. And whatever the problem was, however they fixed it, they fixed it. Thank you, Lord. That's all that matters. <laughs> what an investment. Uh, I didn't get the first name of the man whose book that you read, Genesis, as a research source. Uh, the first name is David, and the last name is Guzik. G-U-Z-I-K. 
I'll put it. G U Z I what? K. K is in King. G U Z K. G U Z I K. I uh, if you can see my whiteboard, I don't know if you can, but if you can, there it is. Goose. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I find it very fascinating what Erlina just said about having the five things. Yes. And how maybe the Spencer didn't realize that that was Genesis verse one. Right. <laughs> I don't know, but exactly. I don't think he did. You know the how, Holy how, Spirit. How it's so marvelous that God put words into people's mouths. Yes. That just back him up so much. Yes. They sometimes don't even know it. Yes. Out of the mouth of babes sometimes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Anyway, welcome back. Good to have you. May it be from here on out that your phone's fixed when you get to join us. But good to have I'm you. I'm so happy to be back. I really am. And we're thrilled to have you back. Any other questions? Comments? Dave, I'm amazed you made it to the end. May the Lord stretch your time. <laughs> But good to have you. Okay, if there isn't anything, we'll close in prayer and then we can open it back up. We don't have to shut down the Zoom room, but some need to run. Some in here are trying to be very quiet. I want to give them the freedom to be able to do what they need to do. Um, I hope it's been a blessing to you. We are moving slowly, but what, did we get to, are we ready for verse 3? Are we? Oh, we even did 3. Okay. So we're going to talk about separating the light from the darkness. We'll talk about the day. I hinted at this, but we'll talk about, I forgot how fast it comes up in my notes. We'll talk about the day. Is it a 24-hour day? Is it a 12-hour day? Is it a period of time? Is it none of the above? What are we talking about? Because we have it extensively through Genesis here in the recreation. So. What are we talking about when we have, uh, because very quickly we're going to have the light called day. So what is it meaning? Okay, those are, there are some of the thoughts that are out there. You can ponder that all week. You can start doing your research. If you read the books that I gave you, you'll be ahead of the teacher. <laughs> and that's okay too. <laughs> so let's uh, close in a word of prayer. Um, I see Maria. I'd love to know what's going through your mind right now because she is off in thought. <laughs> Maybe she'll share it with us afterwards. And um, Wow. Our amazing God, how we thank you for you, how awesome you are, how amazing your creation is, and to me the most amazing that you created man to have an intimate relationship with you. You chose me. You chose us. Lord, what love, what grace, what mercy. There's no way to, to say thank you. There's no way to express. Thank you that you can look into my heart and you can know the depth of the meaning. And I believe I speak for all that are with me in this class. How we adore you, how we thank you, how we praise you, how we stand in awe that even in our sinful state you loved us and you made a way for us to come into right relationship with you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the promise of eternity forever with you in a glorious setting that will never be robbed of the beauty by sin entering in. Thank you that it is forever with you. Thank you that we know those who've gone before us in faith are there with you now. Thank you for your word and for taking the time to help us understand it on our level. We praise you. Let us go out and serve you this week to show you the depth of our appreciation, the love of our hearts. Let us share it with those near and far that they too might know they were created and they were created for a purpose and there's one who loves him so that he wants them to be with him forever. Thank you that we know it. Let us share it in your power by your spirit. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.